Dominic, Klaus, thank you for having us here, your fantastic facilities. IMO 2020, 0.50% global sulfur cap, and six months down the line, that's a big date, and today playing on a shuffleboard table, which is actually made of concrete sulfur, so the very topic the industry is talking about. So, global sulfur cap, a bit short. Global sulfur cap was announced. <laughs> um, what was the reaction here at WinGD? Yeah, initially we were actually um, kind of relaxed, relaxed because uh, with 0.5% sulfur we were expecting cleaner fuels, better fuels, less uh, challenges to the engine, not like with HF4, initially 4.5% sulfur, 3.5% at the moment. And um, get it. From, ah, ah, that ah. was good. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> that almost. That was close. <laughs> So from engine design point of view, initially we were, we were thinking uh, that's going to be easier or better for the, for the engine designs and the components. Do you think that it's, um, it's strange then that owners are so worried about, you know, they're moving to possibly a cleaner fuel regime? Well, I think, you know, we, we have been dealing with uh, heavy fuels and distillate fuels, different levels of uh, sulfur for quite some time. But I think what's new is that uh, in the market there is some concern and worries that the mixing with these new low, lower sulfur fuels that are now coming into the game, that that may create some uh, problems in the field. And this is really interesting because when we started the development of our fuels we didn't even know if it was IMO 2020 or IMO 2025, but we took a conscious decision to start developing those fuels, otherwise we wouldn't be ready to have educated discussion with our customers. But what we have seen in the market is quite a lot of uncertainty, mm. because customers are worried about uh, how to deal with the mixing and would there yeah. be some issues coming up with these new low sulfur fuel grades that, uh, that are going to be in the market. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the interesting thing is that, you know, diesel engine was designed to run on, on diesel um, and we're moving to a sort of potentially cleaner fuels. Um, but we, you know, there is a level of worry out there, and I think pro probably not unfounded, and particularly around sort of um, the compatibility and, and stability side of things with some of the new heavy fuels at uh, 0 0.5. I think compatibility is the biggest issue for customers. They worry a lot, uh, and along that also cat fines. Yeah. Cat fines. Uh, that's why. If you go on board the ship, uh, talk to the chief engineer, one of his biggest worries is always fuel with cat finds, issues with cat finds, wearing off his injection components. That was the shit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when, when introducing the common rail engines, uh, the latest generation in 2011, the X engine generation, we actually also introduced a uh, higher degree fuel filter. We go down to 10 microns exactly to address that. So the engine's well protected and if yes. the owner's using the fuel system yeah. to clean up the fuel as he should be, then effectively there should be no issue. Should, should be no issue. So your customer tells you compatibility is the main issue, but compatibility can be addressed. I mean, uh, even today, we would never advise to mix fuel in equal quantities on a 50-50. You, know, you need to take consideration about the cleanliness of your tank, the cleanliness of your um, fuel system, what is left on board. So it's a combination of understanding the fuel, understanding how you handle the fuel on board and understanding how you've been keeping your tank and fueling system yes. clean over time. It's also, uh, in my view, it's also knowing and understanding what kind of fuel you get on board. Uh, if you talk to customers, the ones that we were running field test with 0.5% sulfur fuels, um, uh, the biggest challenge for the ship owners are actually that the, the, the people on board not necessarily follow the instruction because they have a different rucksack, mm. a different experience, and they think they know better how to do it. Yeah. And that then leads to disaster. So I think this awareness, also training to the crew on board, is, is really essential. You talk about fuel testing. When you test the fuel, it's because the fuel is not ISO compliant. Otherwise, there's no need to test the fuel at sea. And people normally talk about testing, trialing, etc. They're not testing the fuel, they're testing their own onboard handling procedures. 
when I say the word LNG, what comes to your mind? Yeah, LNG for us means the XDF engine, so the dual fuel engine that runs on diesel and gas. Uh, we had a huge uptake of these engines in the market and it's perceived as one solution to control sulfur emissions, uh, NOx emissions, particulate emissions, particular, and it also reduces the CO2 emissions, so it's a very good solution for emissional concerns. Well, okay. And, and, and again, I, I can understand the dimension you Emotion. talk about, but I look at the numbers today, what, 250 ships in the water that use LNG as a, as a form of propulsion? How do you see the future panning out? Well, we have seen an increasing demand uh, for LNG as fuel. So yeah. the demand is clearly increasing and this goes, of yeah, course, goes along the with uh, mm -hmm. the increase of, uh, of the availability. Yes. And the infrastructure. And the infrastructure, that is being absolutely. Built, yeah. built up more and more in, in several countries. So let me share with you how, how we think about um, LNG. Um, when we look at our energy outlook, a view to 2040, we believe that LNG is going to be about 10% of the marine fuel mix. So one of the trends I've noticed is that, as you were saying, Klaus, you know, we moved from early adopter to now penetration in all the different, uh, the different sectors. And also, penetration in high consuming vessels the you know ocean going vessel versus the initial demand of you know ferry or return to base type of type of vessels from a supply chain standpoint i think that the challenges still remain at this point in time it's still mm -hmm. on the table yeah. well but this situation <coughs> seems to improve uh, yes. quite a bit yes lately so Too in fast. many major ports around the world yeah. there is uh, there are initiatives ongoing and activities ongoing to yeah. uh, secure the uh, supply of LNG yeah. and that makes customers more and more confident that LNG is a good option is for the future. Yeah. Yeah. These first movers on LNG as, as fuel, they definitely took a certain uh, business risk, so to say, when, when they opted for LNG and, and they're probably the environmental aspects were more important yeah. than, than the commercial aspect, but uh, also these guys had uh, secured the supply for a long term to yep. make sure that the, the business is viable and, and that can, can power the vessels also in the long term. Yeah, there, there in, has in to a be a competitive space. way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah lubricants are um, re really about moving the, the lubricant to the, the latest engine design. And there's two areas really where I think, um, you know, concern for 2020 is reduce sulfur level so you know the, the traditional cylinder oils that we have in the market today are, are very high bn to deal with the sulfur that's been in the fuel so yeah moving the sulfur out of the fuel we're basically going down to a lower lower bn lubricant okay uh, but at the same time that chemistry within the lubricant was bringing in a lot of detergency right so okay. it's, it's almost a dual mode function of, of the, the, the chemicals that were in the lubricant um, and I think the challenge going forward is it being able to build that back in without the neutralization effect or the, 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 um, the BN basically. Because you don't want that unreactive BN in the cylinder, you're going to get deposits in other areas that could be troublesome. Could yeah. And from an LNG standpoint, Steve, yeah, how does it work? We, again, it's, it's moving into that low or no sulfur regime. So the traditional oh. lubricants that we've seen before <laughs> Um, with, a, with a lot of base number uh, and not really what we need. But by the same token, we've also seen that um, the, the current Sneaky. low BN lubricants don't have the level of detergency and in some cases the level of thermal capability right. to deal with the, the higher temperatures that are in the combustion chamber on, on XDF. I think it is the market demand that has to drive our and, and your activities in terms of developing the, the right solutions. And I think here we have a role to play together yes. as uh, the, uh, the suppliers of the fuel and the oil and the suppliers of uh, the engine the design engine, yeah. to, uh, to develop solutions on our side, on your side, and work together to meet those uh, demands that the market puts on us. We've also got our own small scale two stroke test engine, which is as with all test facilities, it's an evolving beast. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we've been looking at for this year is to make that engine fully hydraulic, so it'll be able to actually mimic some of the cycles that you're thinking about for the future. 
And having that ability to test in small scale with small amounts of experimental lubricants, both on system oil and cylinder oil side, I think is going to be key before we bring the bigger volumes to, to facilities uh, like this, and then even better that we you know we know what we're doing before we go into field trials. Yeah. What about <laughs> what about services? Because one one of the things that uh, always customer talked to, to us about is, you know, ab above and beyond the fuel or the lubricant, how can you help us in lowering our total cost of operation? And when I think about that, I think about services. What do you guys think? Uh, services, uh, this, the entire service environment is moving on with digitalization. We, we have now... Uh, mm. This was mean. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this was mean. It was the only way that I could <laughs> stay in the game. We have, uh, in the meantime, standardized um, recording devices on, on the engine that actually Monitor, okay. monitor the performance and monitor the components uh, online while the engine is running and advise the crew on board or ashore with the right step. So this advice might be in optimizing the running patterns to reduce consumption at the end of the day, improve yep. performance, or this advice might be re related to um, maintenance issues. You have some wear and tear and you know they predict there is predicted lifetime of a component. So, and as you know, we, we also integrated your CCM sensor yes. mm -hmm. into yeah. that system that we also can do the, the uh, scrape down analysis online. Yeah, the tie-in that we have with um, our mobile serve cylinder condition monitoring program and the WinGD integrated digital expert, I think will really play a big part in the future in ensuring that we get really good results Better than that. Better than that. What are you <laughs> <laughs> it's never really been more important to bring in that services aspect and for the owner to really know what he's doing with his ship, with his fuels and, and the condition that they're operating in. Yeah. Um, I think we're, you know, we're moving into a, a new world where monitoring is, is going to be key. Here on, on the research engine, we can switch easily from one, brand, uh, one type of fuel to another and make sure we don't have any compatibility issue and it's quite easy. How you expect the, star, the, the crew on board to handle this now with the new fuels coming with the sulfur cap, the 0.5% sulfur fuel? That's a bit more a challenge, I would assume. It is, it, it is more challenging for the crew on board. So, um, this is the reason why we're launching our engineer marine fuel, EMF.5. We will brand our fuels. Mm. And the reason why we're putting a brand behind is because we want to deliver peace of mind, not only for who buys the fuels, but also not only for who uses the fuel, but also who handles the fuel on board. There is the proof that our fuels are ISO 8217 2017 compliant, mm. but not only that, they're also being extensively tested for fit for use. These fuels are engineered, then they're formulated. They're no longer produced like we used to do in the old mm -hmm. term and provide an advantage to the customer that can see higher efficiency, or lower uh, maintenance cost, and um, higher degree of compatibility with these EMF.5 fuels. And we have seen these concerns in the market as we talked about before that customers are worried about the, the quality and the reliability of the fuel mm -hmm. that they're going to get yeah. now with the changing fuel landscape. Yeah. So that's an interesting approach. It seems to me that the discussion at industry level is now switching from sulfur compliance and 1st of Jan 2020 to beyond 2020. What do you guys see and what do you see from customers? Is that the same type of discussion you start having or you've been having for a while? Well, the uh, IMO greenhouse gas uh, decision to reduce by 50% by 2050 mm. uh, had, of course, triggered quite a lot of uh, additional activities in, yeah. in our company as an engine designer. Well, it is, it is quite a, a wide landscape of different aspects that mm. we have to consider. And uh, when, well, also when we talk to, with, uh, with customers, with ship operators, they, they wonder how they can use the existing 
the existing infrastructure, but also the existing vessels, the existing machinery on board. Exactly. So in yes. the end, the e-fuels need to be in some way usable on a ship, on a, on a, on a vessel with an engine that is there. Yeah. That means storage. Yeah. and availability handling, yes. and handling in the end are the decisive criteria yeah. and we have to find solutions what we can that we can offer that fits yeah. into our customers yeah. so with the sulfur cap many customers had a wait and see attitude until the last moment they they started to make decisions and and now with the greenhouse gas there many customers have become active also to to be perceived uh, in their own sustainability regime in, in the operation, yeah. you know, in their corporate culture, they, they have uh, sustainable targets. It's a mountain to climb with the greenhouse gas regulation. So they, they need to be engaged as a part of that whole industry solution. Anyhow, guys, thank you very much. Uh, great, great being here in your facilities. Great to hear your perspective, your insights, and uh, as we always said, it's a journey, and uh, this is what we're going to continue to do it together. It's a journey together, that's, that's the most important part. Thank you very much. Thank you.